Thanks for joining us here at Faith. We hope that you are encouraged and challenged by today's message. If you'd like to learn more about Faith, our campus locations, and how you can stay connected, check out faithishere.org after this video. Bibles out and turn to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. You guys look amazing this morning. Uh, we've been uh, studying a strategy for struggle, and we have looked at a man who certainly was familiar with struggle, and that's a guy by the name of Joseph. We're taking it from the book of Genesis. And if there's a guy that struggled pretty much every step of the way, it was Joseph. So in each adversity, each struggle he faced along the way, what was his strategy to get him through it? And so the first, we looked at the pit. We stopped by the pit, and we saw Joseph in the pit because his brothers were mad and angry because he got the special coat, and he had all the dreams, and so they're frustrated with him. So how do we handle life when we find ourselves with hurt and pain? And, and we saw that the way to do that is to submit to God and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in him and put your trust in God in our good shepherd. And then last week, we saw what do you do when you struggle with temptation and so our stop there was Mrs. Potiphar and her house, and there we were, and she comes on to Joseph. And so what do we do in the time when we are temptated, when we, are, when we face it, when we go through it? And, uh, and so we looked at that, and the struggle there is remember. Remember who God is and all the blessings of God and how it can hurt your life. You get in this fog, and remember the fog, and remember that, that God has a better way. And then also run. Get out of there as fast as you can. And so he runs out of the house and uh, he spares himself falling into immorality, infidelity, and adultery. And so Joseph flees and God spares him and he makes it through that time of temptation. Now, logically we think, you know, Joseph's a good guy and he fled and he obeyed the Lord, he followed the Lord. You'd think immediately God would reward him, right? He would get maybe a cushy place in the palace. He would be, uh, his life would go well. Everything would go great from then on. But uh, the exact opposite happens. Because when he runs out, she grabs his cloak. And she says, he tried to rape me. And I screamed and I yelled and he ran out. And here's the evidence. And so you think, uh, and so what happens is because that culture is a culture of shame and honor, Potiphar has him thrown into prison. Now, uh, I believe in Potiphar's mind. I think he knew his wife, number one, so he knew her character. He knew who she was and what she was and the manipulator she was. And I think she knew all about, he knew all about who she was. And then, not only that, but he knew Joseph. He knew Joseph was a man of integrity, a man who was faithful, a man who would do nothing to hurt him, and yet he still throws him into the king's prison because honor and shame. He has to save face, and to say, in order to save face, he got to back up his wife, and so he has him thrown into prison. And so he is going to spend some time in prison because he is falsely accused. I, I, think, I think Potiphar, I think Satan tried to defeat Joseph with temptation, peeling to the lust of the flesh. But now Satan's going to come with a different attack. He's going to attack Joseph's mind. Joseph's mind. He's going to get thrown into a prison, a dungeon. It's probably dark down there. But I think the darkest thing that's going on in Joseph's life is what's happening in his mind. Because you got to think by this point, he said, Lord, I've tried to serve you. I tried to serve you at home, but I find myself thrown into a pit. And I've tried to serve you in Potiphar's house and I did my best and I uh, honored you and I didn't fall into temptation or sin and now I find myself in prison. And so he's got to be thinking to himself, what did I do wrong? What else can happen to me? And God, if you are a good God and a good Lord, why do I find myself in this prison time in my life? Listen, all of us have been there. 
All of us struggle with those dark times in our life where we don't understand, God, where are you at and what's going on and I'm trying to serve you and my good just isn't good enough and, and how come if you're a good God, how come I land myself in prison and we have been there. And yet even in prison, Joseph finds himself very faithful once again. And so the prisoner, the warden takes notice of Joseph's life and his character and he begins to elevate and exalt him one more time, and he becomes the head over all those who are in the jail in that prison, and he finds favor with those who are in there. There are two friends that uh, acquaint themselves to Joseph. One is a butler or a cupbearer, is it known as. The cupbearer had awesome responsibilities. He's there because he's going to always sample the cup and make sure no one's trying to poison Pharaoh. And he would often station himself outside of Pharaoh's room and make sure no one get in there. So he was a high-ranking security officer. He was kind of his chief butler. And I don't know what happened to land himself in prison. Maybe he spilt a glass of wine on Pharaoh's carpet. And Pharaoh says, you're going to prison. You're going to jail. I don't know what he did, but he meets the cupbearer. And then he also meets the baker, the chief baker. Chief Baker cooks all the meals, and I don't know if he burnt the pizza or burnt the bread or what he did wrong, but anyway, uh, Pharaoh says, you're going to jail, and so he has him thrown into prison as well. And so it's with that we will pick up our story this morning. Let's all stand together, and uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 40 and verse number 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearers, the chief baker, in the presence of his official. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your word today. I pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. I pray, Lord, that those who are going through their own dark time, their own struggles right now in their own life, Lord Jesus, I pray that they will know and realize that wherever they're at, you are with them and you will see them through. And we thank you, God, for every promise in the word of God. So open up the word again, we pray, fresh and anew this morning. We ask it in your holy, mighty name. Amen and amen. Turn to someone, tell them God is good all the time, and then you may be seated. Joseph is in prison. He, he, these guys have these dreams. And one guy, the baker has a dream, the cupbearer has a dream, and Joseph interprets both dreams. And the dreams come to fruition just like Joseph had seen and just like his interpretation was. And so now he, he is, uh, the cupbearer is elevated. He's restored to his position and to his post. And I'm sure they had some conversations before he got out of jail that day. I'm sure Joseph said, Joseph, hey, man, listen to me. Remember, I'm a foreigner. Remember, I don't deserve to be here. Remember, it's a mistrial. Remember to tell Pharaoh all these things so I can get out of here. And he's hoping that shortly after the cupbearer is released, he too will be released. He will get out because he has won favor with the cupbearer. The cupbearer has the ear of the king. And somehow he's going to get out of that prison. And then he is forgotten. The cupbearer forgets. Listen, how many times have you done something for somebody else? You've done them a favor. You've loaned them some money. You've been nice to somebody. You've helped them along the way. And not even a thank you note, not even a nada, not even an invitation to your house, not even anything in return. And they just forget all about you. And I want to tell you when that happens, it doesn't feel good, does it? No. Say, boy, they just took advantage of me. They just used me. They just used my gifts, used my abilities, and now they've forgotten all about me. And what happens is we can begin to feel sorry for ourselves. Listen, he may have been forgotten by the cupbearer, but no, Joseph was not forgotten by God. God sees, God knows, God knows everything going on in your life, and he will not forget your labor of love. God knows and sees all. And yet in spite of this, and if it had been me, I'd been mad. It's not fair. God, this isn't right. 
I'm obeying you, and I'd have gotten bitter. But there's no indication in the word that Joseph ever got bitter, ever harbored it on the inside, ever took it all in. And so you don't see that in the life of Joseph. So when we look at prison, it's, it's about the struggles we all face. It represents the struggles we all go through at some time in our life, and we all see it. And so this is really the struggle of God's timing. And we think that somehow, God, it's time for you to deliver me. We go to God in prayer. We say, God, help me. And then we expect it to happen today or tomorrow or at least by the end of the week. Two more years. He sits in prison. And so we, we get in these seasons in our life that may seem dark, that may seem discouraging. We go through challenging times and, and we go through that season of pain and, our, and there's something that happens to our body and we pray for healing and God is a healer. God can heal any disease, sickness, and pain for his by his stripes we are healed. But for some reason I've prayed and asked God to heal me and it hasn't happened. And we struggle with that. Some of you struggle with times of loneliness. You've, you've gone through grief and you've lost a loved one and you've lost someone you care about very deeply or, or there's been a separation in your life and it's gone on and, 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 and you go through that season of loneliness and that's very hard. You go through family trials and tests and situations along the way and you go through these struggles and you don't know why and those struggles of discouragement and frustration and those seasons of struggling and we thought it all would be different. But we find ourselves in prison two more years. I, uh, I, last week I drove by uh, the, the field. I was here on Saturday morning, and there's a bunch of guys that play football out there. I like football every Saturday morning. And I remember the glory days when I used to play. I was reliving my past, and uh, that's tongue-in-cheek. If you saw how bad I was, you know I'm making fun of myself. But I, I, uh, about three years ago, I hung up the cleats. I said, I'm done playing football, no mas. And so I, uh, so I quit, and uh, I still miss it. But I remember a day very vividly. It was about 12 years ago. And it was in December because it was the twins' birthday. And this was kind of the last game of the season. We're wrapping up our flag football season. And uh, my wife is hosting the, uh, our kids and the grandkids and all the relatives and all the family and all their friends. And they're hosting all those guys. And uh, she says, I want you to be home by noon. Now, you got to get lunch ready. You got to cook. You got to do all this to grill out, whatever we're doing. You got to do all this stuff. I want you home by noon. And so I said, no problem, I got this. And so uh, don't ever say, I got this. And so uh, it's, uh, it's about 11 o'clock, the game's winding down. We're on the last drive of the game, and I am heading, we're heading down to score to win the game. And the quarterback drops back, and I run out, and I'm on my route, and I make that perfect cut, and I'm right there running across the field. You think this is slow motion. This is actual speed. And I'm running across the field, and he throws the ball, and it's low. And, and I have no, absolutely no chance of catching that ball. But I want to look good. You know, you, you, after all, you want to show you still, still got it. And so I dove, and I laid out, and I broke my collarbone. I landed awkwardly. I shouldn't be doing that in the first place. And uh, at 53 years of age, how many know collarbones don't heal all that quickly? And I was in such incredible pain. And we heard the snap, and uh, it was there, and my arm's hanging down like this. And uh, so they take me to one of those dock in the boxes, uh, uh, medical clinic, you know, quick, quick thing, emergency clinics. And they take me to one of those things and they do the x-rays and they come back and they say, your collarbone is broken, but there's nothing we can do for it. You just got to wear this sling for a while. Eventually it will heal on its own. I think heal on its own works for a 25 year old. It doesn't work real good when you're that age. And so your bones don't heal quite as fast or quite as well, but the, the pain was excruciating. And so I, I, come home and I'm it's about two o'clock now and uh how many know I didn't get one bit of sympathy from my wife I mean my arms hanging out of a socket I'm walking in like this I'm screaming in pain and she looks at me with those eyes you know how they do with the eyes and you know you're in trouble you blew it you should have been here and and for the next three months not one bit of sympathy I was on my own cooking with one hand doing the work and it wasn't quite that bad but it was rough around the Burbacher household for a while. When we, I don't have a very, I can stand anything in the world but pain. 
right? Uh, you, you're with me on this one. I can take anything there is, but, but, but pain and discomfort. And when we go through those seasons of pain, we want out. We want immediate relief. We want it to fix. We want it fixed now. We want the problem fixed now. Because what happens is when we go through those seasons of pain, it works on my self-confidence. Our mind grows in prison. We have doubts and we say, God, why are you allowing this struggle of pain, of darkness, of adversity? Why is this coming my way? And And so what happens is we try to find our own way out. So we think, if I'll just get a better job, that'll fix my pain at work. And so we quit and we bounce from one job to the next job to the next job. Or if I just find a bigger house, or if I just get out of debt and pay off my debts, then everything will be better. Or if I just find a better spouse, a better husband, or a better wife, if that somehow that will fix everything. And so we divorce wife number one, and we think wife number two is going to fix it. And we find these ways of trying to cope and deal with our pain and we try to find our own way out and usually we just make a bigger mess out of the whole situation right if, if, if I just if I can just do this thing everything's going to be all right and some will turn to drugs and they'll turn to alcohol because they think somehow that will numb the pain I won't have to deal with it at least I'll feel a little bit better at the time but the pain never ever goes away because we have that season of being in prison And we're there and we see no way out whatsoever. So so what is our strategy? What's the strategy for dealing with our prison? Take your Bibles out, turn to James chapter one. James chapter one. Look at verse number two. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. what's What's our strategy for struggle for the prison? First of all, I want you to consider the promise. Consider the promise. Now, in James chapter one, he says, consider it pure joy. When you're in prison, when you face trials, when you struggle, when you go through these times of difficulty, our defense mechanisms screams out in our brain, do all we can to avoid pain and discomfort and trials. And James says, be happy. We wanna say, James, what were you thinking when you wrote that, be happy? Do you know the kind of trials and the tests and what I'm going through right now? That sounds absolutely crazy. But he says, consider it pure joy. Now, in the Greek language, it literally means to count it up, to add it all up, consider it, or to consider the sum. Now, now when I was growing up in school, I I wasn't bad at math. I was pretty good. I wasn't good enough to make the advanced math classes, so it wasn't until the ninth grade that we got a subject called algebra. How many remember algebra? It's one of those things you will take in high school you'll never, ever use again, which is like most of school. And so it's one of the things that you won't have to use ever again the rest of your life. Algebra. It's it's like math and English got together and they had a baby and they called it algebra. (laughs) Right? You know what I'm talking about. And and so you walk into school. So let me see if I can illustrate this for you. Uh, You walk into school and the teacher's there and it's your first day. I know you guys are all brilliant, so you're gonna answer this. If you can't see it from the sides, you'll see it on the big screen. And it really doesn't matter anyway because no one can read my writing. So I'm just doing this. Uh, But anyway, so you walk into screen, A plus B equals C, right? You got that? And so your teacher proceeds to tell you, if A is four, and C is six, what is B? Five people know it, okay, great. You guys all flunked algebra. Two, right? We, we, we got this one figured out, two. And, and, and you're gonna learn through algebraic equations, by the way, they get a whole lot more complicated than this. And they said, if you wanna find out what B is, you gotta do the same thing to both sides, right? And so what you do is you subtract four from this side to get rid of the A, and you subtract four from this side, and so now you have B equals two. Okay, right? That's how algebra works. So you just, give yourself a hand. You guys are amazing scholars. 
in this room. Okay. So, so, so now, now here's the thought to me. First, you'd say A plus C equals uh, A, A plus B equals C. C is six. If you already know the answer, why even do the problem? You know, that's that's my first thought. I already know it's six. Uh, we're done, we're finished, we're, we're done with that and over. And so we should be good at that point. Now, here, here's the deal in spiritual equations. If A is Jesus, right? A is Jesus. A is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the letter A. Everything builds and rests upon him. He is our everything. If C represents the promise, right, for your life. C represents the promise. According to James... What's he tell us that is for our life so that you may be perfect, mature, not lacking anything, right? Okay. Now what happens is we get stuck on B. B becomes our prison. It's all we see. It is magnified in our lives. We're in jail. It's dark. It's damp. It hurts. It's painful. My struggle, my pain, my heartache, my cares, all this. And what happens is we can get so our eyes so much on the problem that we never are the solution to the problem. We're looking for what B is. What is B? What is B? We're looking for the solution so much that we fail to see the promise. We don't see the promise that God has for us. Or we get so fixated on the problem, on the prison, on the jail time, on the, what's two? Two years. Right? For Joe, it was two years. Two more years. We get our eyes off Jesus Christ, who's the author and perfecter of our faith, who has all power, all might, and all authority. The promise, the promise is there. God has a promise of kingdom fulfillment in your life. He has the promise of an abundant, full life in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a kingdom purpose for you at work. He has a kingdom purpose for you on your neighborhood. He has a kingdom purpose for you and your family. He has pr promises for your life. But we get stuck in the B, we lose sight of the A, and we lose sight of the sea. What would happen if instead we begin to focus on how great God is and we turned our attention to our mighty Lord, our mighty Savior, all his power, all his might, and we kept our eyes, as the word of God said, fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. I got my eyes fixed on him. What would happen if we focused more on the A and not so much on their situation? What would happen if we begin to focus more on the sea and begin to dream again about God's plan and purpose for my life? And according to James, he tells us that you may be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. What if we begin to refocus on the sea and we begin to dream again? Keep your eyes on the promise. Second, I want you to consider the process. Consider the process. This, just went dark in here, it felt like. Wow, that's pretty cool. Consider the process. Uh, what, what is your B, your obstacle, your pain? What if your B is already a part of the equation? To have this algebraic equation, you've got to have the B. What if God's B, what if God's prison time, what if God's delay, what if God's timing, what if God's waiting is all a part of the equation to get you to the C? Right? And isn't that the way God works? It will ultimately, in God, in our viewpoint of way of thinking, it, it will help you uh, get to your promise that God has for you. What if the season of waiting is actually God's development time? That he is using this time to develop you. And so that's what James says. He says, trials will come your way, tests will come your way, but it develops perseverance. And perseverance and patience will do what? Make you perfect and complete and mature so that you don't lack anything in your life. And so he says what? Let perseverance have its work. Let perseverance finish its work in you. And we're trying to avoid the bee. We don't like the bee. We don't like it, but Jesus allows it. Jesus keeps us here for a season. What? So that ultimately we can understand and know the full promises of God. It's a part of his development strategy in our life. Mm. 
In your trial, God is growing you. In your season of delay, God is growing you. In your hurt, God is growing you. He will use your plan B to shape your dream. Hmm. Now, now, in the early days, Joseph, when he's at home, he's the dream receiver, right? And he gets this dream. My brothers are going to bow down to me. My dad's going to bow down to me. He has a great dream for his future of one day ruling and leading. That's his dream. He's the dream receiver. But something else happens when he gets in prison. He becomes the dream interpreter. And so God begins to develop all the giftings that are in Joseph's life while he is in that prison time. And what does he mean to do? Begin to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the chief baker so that ultimately he can interpret Pharaoh's dream and save the nation of Egypt. Had he not been in prison, none of that would have happened. God will use those prison times, those seasons of delays, those times of waiting. Next week, we're going to see how God uh, used those gifts to promote Joseph, allow him to save Egypt, and and, and indirectly also save the nation of Israel, that new birthing nation of Israel. Your delays and pain do not represent the absence of God. And here's the rub. We get in prison, and we think, God, where are you? You've left me. But in the process, God is working in you, and not only has he not left you, he went with you inside of your prison. He's right there with you every single step of the way. Your A is always there. (laughs) Genesis 39, 21, the Bible says that when he was in Potiphar's house, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. When he was in the pit, the Lord was with Joseph. And I will tell you, when he is in this prison, the Lord was with Joseph. He did not send Joseph to prison. He went with him. Listen to Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Wow. I will never, ever ever leave you nor forsake you i'm there i'm right there with you no matter how desperate your situation may be god is with you and the bible says he is working all things together for good to those who love the lord i may not understand at the time i may not totally see what's going on i i may I'll go through those seasons of self-pity and self-doubt and doubts and that may all come my way in my prison time, but God is there and he is working out his purposes. Consider the process. Again, James chapter one, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. Finish the process so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Joseph was advancing all the way, all the way down the road. As we look at Joseph's life, we would think he wasn't advancing. He was being demoted. We would think he's being punished. He's going through trials and tests. And in the world's viewpoint, he's not being promoted and he is not advancing. But but God is working in him the entire time. So he's becoming more and more mature wiser and wiser along the way his gifts are being honed his skills are being developed and he is growing in his maturity in christ jesus he's advancing in the kingdom although it may not seem like that in the world every turn god is working in his life think hypothetically with hypothetically with me for just a moment Had Joseph been killed with his brothers, there'd be no Egypt experience. There would be no saving of Egypt. That would have never happened. It would never came about. But God had a plan for Joseph that took him through the pit and on into slavery. Had Joseph yielded to temptation with Mrs. Potiphar, uh, he probably would have not wound up in prison. He'd have been fine. They'd have carried on their secret affair. No one would have known. No one would have talked. Had a little fun on the side. If he had given in to temptation. Instead, he stands for the Lord Jesus Christ, stands for God, and he winds up in prison itself. Had he got into prison and refused to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the chief baker, he would have never got to the position where he could interpret Pharaoh's dream. So he had to go through prison that he might meet a cupbearer 
that he might eventually interpret Pharaoh's dream and be second in command of the entire nation of Egypt and literally save that nation from starvation. So for us today, how is God going to use his delay in your life his timing in your life, how is he going to use that? How is he going to use your hurt and your pain and your situation? He's going to take it all and give you a platform for his glory. And so because Joseph goes to the pit, goes through Potiphar's house, goes through prison, he is elevating the platform for which Joseph could reveal the glory of Almighty God. And every trial and test that comes your way, when you come through it, you will have a testimony to the greatness and power of Almighty God. We need a perspective shift. Get my eyes off the bee. Get my eyes off his delay and his pain and get my eyes on Jesus Christ and begin to understand God is working to produce the sea, complete, whole, not lacking anything. Now, it, it says in verse 23 of Genesis 40 that it's, it makes this one simple statement. It says, and the cupbearer forgot Joseph. The cupbearer forgot Joseph. He's going to spend two more years in prison. But always know he was never, ever forgotten by God. God knows, he sees, he understands, he knows what you are going through. And all God is using every single one of these events to, to work in your life. So you may mature, complete, not lacking anything. Listen, I don't know what you're facing today. I do not know what season you are in. I don't know what your struggle is with today. And you may not see a way out in the natural and it doesn't make sense and it hasn't been adding up, but consider the sum. Consider the full equation. Consider the sum. We may not see and know why, but God cares. God loves you. He is with you and he's working something out in your life. Get a fresh revelation of the glory and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you, no matter how, how dark it may seem, dare to dream again. Dare to dream again. God has a dream for every single one of you here today.